Here, we study the last moments of those who perished in disaster. Mother Nature is a beast, and we are made in her image. My name is Chris Bumpus, and this is... As I do the research for the episodes of this report, I've noticed subtleties in language in how disasters are described. The word unknown can be gut-wrenching, and the term lost in its many applications is distressing. A phrase I came across in the research for this particular story upset me, despite seeming pretty benign. My eyebrows raised at the words, at least, because in the introduction of this catastrophe, the death toll was described as at least 317 people. As you will, I came to discover why it was written so. The second deadliest tornado to wreak havoc in America struck the area of Natchez, Mississippi in 1840. Natchez was founded as an American town in 1797, but before that, the area had been under the control of Spanish colonialism. What I've read about Natchez claims that the town was founded when an American major reached it and, with the raising of the Stars and Stripes, declared that all of that land east of the Mississippi was American territory. Records of international diplomacy during this period are difficult to sift through, so I don't understand how this claim was honored by Spain. I guess Great Britain granted the U.S. that land within the Treaty of Paris, which does not seem to have anything to do with Spain, but I'm done trying to figure it out. Somehow, an accord must have been struck, because the Mississippi Territory was founded, with Natchez as its capital. The Mississippi Territory became the state of Mississippi in December of 1817, with Natchez continuing to be the capital. Jackson, Mississippi ended up stealing away that title in 1822. And that feels like the last I want to say about the town before we delve into its experience with calamity. The violent tornado originally touched down about 20 miles south-ish of Natchez proper, but it only really becomes relevant to our analysis when it reaches the river port of Natchez Landing. The tornado that was, at that point, only whipping up water and vegetation, found some new ammunition at the docks. At this site, the tornado threw 116 flatboats into the air and across a radius of many miles. I'm gonna slow it down right here, because that's insane. Flatboats are not small. They were used to transport cargo of any persuasion up and down the Mississippi. For this reason, picturing 116 boats being launched into the air just astounds me. As we pick up the story from Natchez Landing, it is worth mentioning that essentially all of the port's infrastructure was decimated. We will, of course, come back to the fatalities of this event, but many victims were taken by the tornado at this juncture. The tornado, from the river port, found a course directly up to the town of Natchez, where the devastation continued. Witnesses described the swirling eddies of the tornado being dark and shrouded given the sheer amount of material it was sweeping up. Onlookers were able to identify fragments of roofs, foundations, and timber being carried to the very brim of the towering cyclone. Unlike other episodes of this report, I'm going to keep my scientific explanation of tornadoes fairly succinct. Tornadoes generally start as mesocyclones within a thunderstorm a consistently swirling pocket of air high in the atmosphere. Once these mesocyclones are dragged downward by increasing rainfall, they find a descending path of air known as a rear flank downdraft, and the cyclone drops toward the ground. Closer to the ground, the downdraft increases in acceleration, which causes the rotational energy of the cyclone to increase in tune. The second part of my analysis of the Natchez tornado will focus on the casualties of the event. Now, the reported deaths caused by this tornado paint a very clear picture. Accounts of the aftermath of the Natchez tornado show over 80% of the around 320 associated deaths to have taken place at the Mississippi River. To be specific, we are talking about around 
269 fatalities confirmed at the Natchez landing area. The final and most important, as well as most clearly overlooked, piece of this puzzle lies in the last destination of this horrible whirlwind. People across the river and further up, living in Concordia Parish, Louisiana, reported the incoming tornado from its last encounter with Natchez. I'm not sure if the difference between these two places really lies in the fact that they were in two different states. During this period, the mid-1800s, the country was, truly, divided among many things. However, one concept that Louisiana and Mississippi probably did not disagree on, slavery. We'll get back to that though. If we now rejoin the tornado of 1840, it barrels through a considerable distance of farmland and portside infrastructure in Concordia Parish. The tornado truly lays waste across the entire landscape, with the weakest structures succumbing more quickly. Some witnesses from there in Louisiana wrote that the tornado was strongest after it cleared Natchez and went to Concordia Parish. These witnesses also reported that the tornado ran directly through farms and the slave barracks inside were torn apart. At this point, I want to finally outline the issue with the recorded narrative of this tornado. In America, in the mid 19th century, slaves were considered property of someone else. And it's a difficult truth, but really, there were white landowners that would have put a higher price on their armchair than a person they, quote, owned. For that reason, because of that mentality, history cannot tell us how many people died while the great Natchez tornado roamed. Folks there said that hundreds of slaves died, and to me that could mean as many or more than the 317 reported. I speak now on an American history that isn't my own, but the analysis, my analysis, of this event needs to acknowledge the state in which a slave was living in Louisiana at this time. Specifically, I want to outline the impermanence of living as a slave in the American South. Anyone, anyone among the slave population could be sold at any time on the whim of a landowner, and deaths at every age were more common among slave communities. Now, when the tornado came, it's easy to realize that the horrible winds killed many people, but when it tore through slave communities, it devastated already suffering families in a profound way. The history we are told in America discounts too much from the significant events of humanity. As I do more and more research into phenomenal disasters of history, I am continually confronted with nameless deaths and question marks. To deny our own history does not erase it, but serves only to prolong our collective ignorance. The names of the slaves who perished at Natchez may have gone unrecorded, but their losses were felt deeply nonetheless.